Uh, if you'd remain standing, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 2. And, uh, you know, typically Brother James might come up here and introduce, you know, the speaker. Uh, well, tonight he's under the weather, I'm told, and Pastor called me about 30 minutes before the service and said, James is going to be there tonight, so you're going to have to lead uh, songs, you're going to lead the prayer meeting, thankfully Rob is here to help with that, you'll do announcements, and you're going to have to introduce yourself as well. So I am the guy who did songs, but I'm also the guy who did announcements, and I'm also the guy who's going to be preaching to you tonight, so hopefully you're not... You've not gotten your fill of Frank by the end of tonight here, but amen. It's good to be in God's house, and I'm excited to preach the text uh, that God has given me here tonight in Hebrews 2. Uh, so let's go to the Lord in prayer before we start our message, and then we'll read the entirety of Hebrews chapter 2. Father, thank you so much for your goodness in our lives and for all you do for us uh, each and every day, Lord, and you're so faithful to us, and we just want to thank you for it. And Father, I'm so excited to be preaching on this text tonight. I know you gave it to me uh, Sunday afternoon as I was considering what you'd have for me to preach, Lord, and I'm just thankful that came to this text. And uh, Lord, I just pray that's a blessing to everyone who's here tonight, both saved and lost. I believe there's something in here for everyone here in attendance tonight, and I just pray that you meet every need according to your will, and everything that's said and done would be pleasing to you tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Hebrews 2, we'll begin reading verse 1. The Bible says, Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, and with diverse miracles, and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet, for in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And again I will put my trust in him. And again behold I and the children which God hath given me. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people." For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. Thank you. You may be seated. I mean, we just read it, but Hebrews 2, what a great portion of Scripture that we'll be preaching from this evening. There's so much in there from start to finish, so many different topics that I think we have the opportunity to cover tonight. And, you know, some of the things we're going to look at are the strong and earnest plea to take heed to the Word of God. We'll see God's goodness to all mankind manifested plainly, but most of all, as I've titled the message tonight, we'll see Jesus. And that is what I want to make one of the primary focuses of tonight's message is seeing Jesus high and lifted up as he ought to be. And so for those of us who are saved tonight, seeing Jesus, ought that not be our aim as we walk into this place on a Wednesday night, right? As we get through the hustle and bustle of our day, we get ourselves and our families here to church, 
to be in our seats, you know, in a hurry by 7 o'clock, be here and ready in the middle of the week? Shouldn't it be for the purpose of coming to see Jesus? That's what we should be here for. And if that's not our motivation in being here and putting all that effort in to get here, then why come at all, right? If you're not here to meet with the Lord as a saved person, then there's really no sense in coming, right? I think it puts it into perspective when we see it that way. Surely, I would think, you didn't come here to hear myself tonight, right? I wouldn't come to just hear myself here at church, no matter who it was, right? If it's me, pastor, Brother Fryman, Brother Kuzel, it doesn't matter who's up here preaching, that's not what we come here for. We don't come here for a speaker. That's not a good enough reason in and of itself to be in God's house. But if your intention is to come and worship and speak to through prayer and hear from the Lord tonight, and that's your heart attitude, well then, amen, you're in the right place tonight. Amen. And so let's worship God as we get into our message here, you know, thinking about just going through those motions. I feel like I talk about it a lot about duty versus devotion or doing it out of a heart of love. Um, and there's a reason for it, and I'll get into that in a second. But just going through the motion of putting on nice clothes, carrying our Bibles in, leaving our home or workplace to get here, drive all the way to church because it's our duty, that is not enough to please God. It's not about checking a box. God is not pleased solely by our activity, but it is well-pleasing to God if we obey his commandments outwardly with the joy of the Lord inwardly, right? And so just coming to do all the things that God wants us to do, it's not enough unless our heart is fully in it, right? And I would say, like, when I think about Christianity, when I think about my spiritual life with God, you know, just doing the right activities doesn't equal an outcome of spiritual success, right? Just reading your Bible, just praying, just coming to church, just witnessing, just tithing, just being a faithful church member doesn't mean you're necessarily going to have this great outcome of being a, a spiritual uh, giant for the Lord, right? The outcome isn't just by our activity. That's not the only component. It's not the only piece. There's more to it. It's what's going on in the inner side of our hearts. What's going on on the inside? Are we doing it in the right spirit? And so in my own experience, the flesh will burn out. And when God is not in the midst of our activity, what we say, what we do, what we think, why we're doing it, this will inevitably lead to frustration on our part, and the Lord is not going to be pleased by it. Right? We're going to be frustrated because we're thinking, I'm doing all that God wants me to do, but I'm not getting the outcome that I'm, that I'm hoping for, right? which is spiritual blessing upon my life, having that close relationship with God, knowing that my sin account is being kept short with God. I'm not really getting that outcome I want as a Christian. It's because maybe your focus is just on your duties, your activities, and not why you're doing them to begin with. And so consider that tonight, beloved, is uh, as before we get into our outline here, take a moment to think about your heart attitude so that our worship together as believers will be a sweet-smelling savor unto God here in this place tonight, coming from a heart of devo devotion, not something simply done out of duty. And the last point I'll bring up on this, as I mentioned, I, I feel like I'm bringing up this, this duty thing instead of devotion because it's really just a common snare that we all fall into. It's easy for us to become accustomed to doing the right things because we know we should, right? We know what's right here. We're trained well. We're taught well. But just doing those things does not equal the outcomes that we're desiring. And when it comes to many things in life, again, we can fall into this trap because in many areas of our life, we can do the right things. Think of a couple things, right? Showing up for work every day. We're pretty, pretty good at doing that. Are we doing it out of a heart of love for our boss or devotion to him or her? No, we're doing it because it's our duty, right? paying our bills. You don't do it necessarily out of a hard attitude of love for that, you know, that person who sent you the bill. You're doing it because it's a duty. Same thing with household chores, you know, weeding the, the, the garden or cutting the grass or whatever it is. We're not doing those things because we love the activity. We're doing them because it's a duty. It's a requirement. It's something we have to do. It's a responsibility. And so it's fine to some extent to do all of those things out of a duty, right? That's okay. We're kind of used to that in a temporal sense. But when it comes to things of God, our Lord places immense value on the why rather than just the what, right? It's all about why are we doing it, not just what are we doing. He cares more about the hidden man of the heart, our thoughts, our intents, than he does just about the mere activities we find ourselves doing. You know, pastor said this so often, so many times I remember him, you know, him saying this. 
But it's a similar point that anyone, saved or lost, can perform the actions of teaching Sunday school, witnessing for Christ, attending church faithfully, tithing, praying, reading your Bible, all of those things. Whether you're saved or lost, you can do those physical activities. Anyone can do them. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you're saved, right? We know that. Judas did many, if not all, of those things. He was clearly not saved. And so, yes, it means that you may not be saved, but also it doesn't mean that if you are saved, just doing all those things does not mean that you're doing them out of a heart of love or with the right intentions. So let's all, beloved, as we head into our message tonight, let's consider our ways as well as our intentions heading into the message this evening. So our first point I want to take a look at is I want to see the vigilant Christian. We're exhorted here in verses 1 through 4 to be vigilant as Christians. Let's go back to Hebrews 2 and in our text, and let's read again verses 1 through 4. The Bible says, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to what? The things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast in every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his will. You know, the entirety, just to take a step back here, entirety of chapter 1 of Hebrews really consists of a recounting of historical truths about God and his character, about the Lord Jesus Christ, the angels, about mankind and the kingdom of God that will endure even one day when the world as we know it has come to an end. That's what chapter 1 is really encompassing, right? It's just a, a recounting of these truths. And then chapter 2 opens up by stating that we should give the more earnest heed to the things which we've heard lest at any time we should let them slip. What is this, you know, this passage talking about? It's about all of those things that were recounted. It's about biblical doctrine and truth, right? We need to take an earnest heed to those things. And so, you know, thinking about it in context of, of Hebrews being written, you know, primarily to the Jews, there were many Jewish converts who were being pressured. Christians, right? But they came out of Judaism they were being pressured to forget or to leave their new faith and pretend that the truth, which they'd been enlightened with, had somehow never happened. It wasn't real to them. They were being pressured from other Jews who were not saved to, to turn away from their, from their newfound faith, to act as though something they knew to be true somehow was actually not indeed true. And so let me put this for a second into 2024 vernacular for us here tonight. The Jews, those who chose not to follow Christ, all wanted to believe and share their truth, right? It wasn't reality, it wasn't truth, but they wanted others to believe and adhere to their truth, right? What they felt to be, or what they wanted to believe was actually true. And so even though this feels like kind of a new trend, right? Saying things like my truth, their truth, his truth, her truth, we've all pretty much heard that at this point. This is a thing now. Um, you know, even though we've all heard that, um, you know, this devilish behavior of misrepresenting or questioning the actual truth has been around since the very beginning in the garden. So turn with me to Genesis chapter 3. It feels like a new thing, right? It feels like a 2023, 2024 trend, but it's actually been around for a long, long time. Genesis 3, 1 through 5, the Bible says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. You know, I was reading this the other day, and I'm thinking the, the really interesting thing about this, it kind of just occurred to me, I don't know if it's ever occurred to you when reading that passage, but I was thinking that both the woman and the serpent knew what the truth actually was. They both knew the truth. 
They knew that God said not to eat of that tree. They both knew it to be the truth. And yet, somehow, because the serpent questions and misrepresents the truth, Eve disobeyed, right? And in doing so, the serpent, the devil, persuades Eve to disobey the word, the truth. And this is a tactic used all the way back in the beginning, but it is the same practice we see employed today. We see people trying to persuade others to something that's actually not true, not factual at all, but trying to bring people by the masses to come and believe this thing that isn't even real. And that's exactly what the devil did in the very beginning here. We find people believing in fallacies like alien life on other planets, the Big Bang Theory. I mean, just apply some common sense logic and say something exploded and yet order turned out from it. I mean, when have we ever seen that ever in the history of mankind? We haven't. So it's, it's clearly a fallacy. And then we also see evolution, right? We see the confusion of our day. Um, we can get into so many different things there, but all of these fallacies, these, these, these trends that, that come about in our society, these belief systems that come about that aren't based on anything factual, anything truthful whatsoever, and yet people believe in them. All of these things are contrary to scripture. And so, What's the simple solution to it, right? It is basing everything you believe on the Word of God, giving that more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. And so that's why we're exhorted. That's why we're warned in verse 1 of our text uh, to follow what is written down in Scripture. We know that the Bible is the source of absolute truth, and it can be trusted implicitly. Right? There's so many people here, so many people throughout our world, so many people throughout history who've not gone wrong by placing everything they believe, basing it on the Word of God. Right? You cannot go wrong that way. We've seen time and time again the examples all throughout history of that, that approach. And we also know that men and women are sinful and untrustworthy, and only God in His book can be trusted for our eternity. Why follow a doctrine, a belief system that was created by another man just like you? Right? Why worship some sort of idol made out of something that your own hands can create and develop. How does that make any sense, right? How do you put your own eternity in the hands of that person, that belief system, that thing, whatever it may be? Isn't it far greater to put it in the creator of the universe, right? It seems pretty straightforward to me when I think about it. So the question for us all here tonight, saved and lost, what fables have you been taking heed to? What fables have been catching you up a bit of late. What media have you, and it could be any media, right? Any, any sort of media, very general term, what media have you allowed into your life that's been slowly but surely creeping into and eroding the truth of God in your heart? What have you opened yourself up to? We know that the devil is cunning. Genesis 3 shows us exactly how he can infiltrate the heart and mind of someone who knows what the truth actually is and change their minds completely in a short period of time. So he's been deceiving men for millennia. He's an expert at slowly creeping into hearts and sowing those seeds of doubt. And so we got to be on guard against that. That's why we're warned in verse 1 to take heed lest at any time we should let them slip. We don't want to let them slip. And what does this word slip mean exactly? It's kind of an interesting word to use, I would say. This word slip means a thing that passes by, something that slips from or escapes the mind, something that was there, but it's gone. Um, I hate to say it, but that happens to me regularly throughout my day. I'm juggling this priority, that thing. Someone's calling me. I just got off this meeting. I got to do this thing. Someone's asking me this. Stuff is slipping in and out of my mind all day long. It's like a mush upstairs by the end of the day. Um, and that's what really what's being referred to here. Something that was in your mind you had, but it's gone. And, and the last thing you want to slip out of your mind is the truth of God's word, the doctrine that we all should be taking heed to. And as Christians, we cannot afford to let the truth of God's word slip out of our minds or to escape or to pass by our hearts and our minds. When this happens, we are at risk of listening to false doctrine, to allowing our standards to drop and being a poor testimony to others. That's what's going to naturally be the result of not holding the truth of God near and dear to our hearts, not allowing it to guide and direct our way day in and day out. 
You know, to me, the thought of letting something slip makes me think of some leverage being lost, maybe in a competition or in a battle, right? Like you, you lose that upper hand uh, to someone else. You give it away unnecessarily. You know, maybe you're in an arm wrestle and, and you've let them kind of get that extra upper hand on top of you. You've let that advantage slip away. And so this is, that, this is why we have that strong warning given to God's people to take earnest heed lest you should let them slip. Think about those three words, though. Take earnest heed. All of those things are pretty powerful words. They're active words. They're, they're, there's a lot of power in, in those three words there. Take, right? That's like, it's almost an aggressive, like take, right? Not, not be passive about it, but be very active. Take, earnest, right? That, that, to me, speaks of something that's really, really, really important, right? Take, earnest, and heed, right? I always think of heed as heed the warning, right? Take heed. So really, really important terms that are used. And I think God is trying to put a special emphasis on our responsibility as Christians to take heed to what we know, to take heed to the truth that we know. So don't allow the world to influence you and gain an advantage, but rather let the word dominate your life. That's the solution, right? Is, is making sure that the word of God is at the forefront of your life every single day that you're in God's word. And so we're warned to be vigilant Christians. But for our second point, I want to talk about our visiting creator. Let's look at, if we go back to Hebrews chapter 2, back to our text. Let's look at verse 6. The Bible says, but one in a certain place testified, saying, what is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? And it just led me to think, like, why would the creator of the universe pay any mind to sinful men? I mean, really, what, what have you or I done to deserve or merit such unconditional favor or such love from God? Does anyone have any ideas why God would care so much about us? That he would, uh, that what is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? To see the amount of effort that God puts in to his creation, to, to sinful men. In truth, we've only done things that would make us deserve the complete opposite, in my opinion, right? Why should we get favor or, or love or care from God or mindfulness? If anything, we should deserve the total opposite based off of how we live, based off of our sinful nature. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 64. Isaiah 64, we'll read one verse. Go down to verse 6. The Bible says, But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. So think about that. Put it into context. All of us were unclean. Our best, our righteousnesses, are filthy rags in the sight of God and we fade away, and our iniquities have taken us away. And yet to know that God has the very hairs of our head numbered, that he cares so much about us, that Psalm 139, 17 through 18 tells us, how precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. And I'm just going to ask the audience, I don't expect an answer, but does anyone here even have the slightest chance at guessing the amount of grain of sand that is in the sea? It's, it's innumerable, right? Do you also, right? You probably, here on this earth, would know the most about yourself than anybody else. How many, how many hairs are on your head? Do you know? No, right? I was thinking, you know, depending on how Mother Nature treats me as time goes on, maybe I'll lose some of this hair in time. Maybe someday I'll have a chance, but today I got no shot, right? I don't know how many hairs are on this head of mine. And yet God does because he cares so much for us, because he has such an interest in each and every one of us, in every man, right? What is man that thou art mindful of him or that thou should, shouldest visit it, that thou visitest him? And so we see the close attention that God gives to us, the detail that he knows about us, uh, and then the amount of innumerable, precious thoughts 
unto us, right? Psalm 139, as I mentioned, how precious also are the thoughts unto me, O God. To not just think that God thinks about us, but he has precious thoughts about his children. So Christian, what a privilege to be known of God and loved by God. Do we appreciate the Lord as we ought to? Do we cherish his love? And do we reciprocate his goodness to us by doing the things that God wants us to, right? By investing back into the relationship that God has given everything to. Uh, the least we can do is, is invest back into that relationship um, in, in a reciprocative fashion. Or, on the flip side, do we demonstrate ingratitude or a lack of love for God by shirking our devotional life with Him, right? Do we, do we put off our devotions? Do we not uh, prioritize our relationship with God? We're only hurting ourselves, and we're also hurting our most important relationship, the one between us and the Lord. And I think it's, you know, it goes without saying, our relationship with God is the most important relationship. I think that's, that's obvious, because He's the only one with whom we have to do when all this is said and done here on earth. Um, but I also think that our relationship with God is so important as well because it really sets the tone for our relationship with, with others, with our family, uh, with our friends, with our acquaintances, our coworkers, other people we encounter or come across. If our relationship with God is on right, if we're experiencing unconditional love from God and we know what that feels like, I think it's going to make enough of an impact on us that we're going to say, hey, let's, let's give some unconditional love here. Let's be a little more forgiving to my fellow man here when they've done me wrong, right? And so we're, that, that really sets the tone for how we as, as men and women uh, and young people, how we treat others. And that's why I think one of the reasons, one of the many, why our relationship with God is the most important one that we could ever, ever have, and we should be spending as much time as possible in that relationship. But lost friend, I want to ask you, I want to take a moment to address you in this context here as well. Consider the magnitude of God's love. Think about his care and his desire to save you. I just talked about all the things that God thinks about us as, as men and women, as people. Not only does he know everything about you, but he created you. And knowing that you'd need a savior who'd cleanse you from all of your transgressions, he made a way of escape by both orchestrating and enacting the plan of salvation by sending his own son. Right? He didn't just create the plan of salvation and give it to somebody else. He actually created the plan and then called his own number and said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. It has to be by sending my own son to come and die for all men. So how do you, how do you turn that away? Right? How do you say, I, I, I don't want this, this grace. I don't want this forgiveness. I don't want this mercy. I don't want this salvation that's offered freely. I urge you tonight to consider that and how good God is to you. Let's go back to Hebrews from Isaiah 64, let's go to Hebrews chapter 2 again. Let's look at verse 9, where the Bible says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Jesus, God the Son, part of the Godhead himself, decided to come down to earth and take the form of a sinful man yet without sin. And he took on our form. This form is, is in the form of a sinner. Other than Christ, no one else has ever taken on this flesh and been able to resist the temptation to sin, has ever been sinless in their life. And so think about such a loving Lord to accept such a humbling, right? To, to be God, and yet to accept this humbling when he took on the form of man here some 2,000 years ago. The creator of the universe the eternal and ever-living one, takes on human flesh for the sole purpose of one day, not just to be here and live a good life and live sinless and then, and then go back to heaven, right? No, he actually came here to live by an example, a sinless life, to fulfill all the prophecy in the Old Testament that, that mentioned or was speaking about Christ and his life. And then what was the, the finale to it all? To die a cruel death for those sinners that he came to save. Can we even begin to comprehend the love that Jesus has expressed to all of us so freely? Right? We didn't ask for this as sinners. If anything, we've pushed God away, and yet he's offered it so freely to us all. Jesus came down to taste death for every man. This means that he experienced physical death in a man's flesh so that we who receive God's free gift of salvation 
will never have to experience spiritual death in the lake of fire one day. Right? So he came to do the thing of feeling, experiencing physical death so that we can have spiritual life one day in return. So thanks to the great miracle that Jesus performed on the cross, we who are saved are no longer under condemnation. We can escape the wrath that is to come through the blood of Christ shed on Mount Calvary. What a blessing. Thank God for that tonight if you're saved. I want to look at verse 16 as well. Let's read that now. Verse 16 says, For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. You know, earlier in our text, um, verse 9, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. Here in verse 16 it says, For verily he took not on him the nature of angels. You know, Jesus could have taken maybe one step down to become an angel and come to earth, right, and to, to fulfill what he needed to. He could have done that. He could have, he could have come one step down and, and, and decided to be an angel and come to earth. But he chose not to. He chose to come as a man, just like you and me. He came just like us, to experience the same pain and suffering, to not be a level above, but to be essentially at an equal level from a, a fleshly man point of view. He came down to be equal with us in that way. He knew uh, and experienced the problems of our flesh, lustfulness, deceit, lasciviousness, anger, hatred, jealousy, envy. And Jesus lasted 33 plus years in the flesh, just like all of us, with the same sinful struggles that we all deal with, yet without sin. Right? Experience the same thing we all do, and yet without sin. So we saw our visiting creator. He came down here on earth. He visited among us as the creator, came down to earth in the flesh of sinful men. And now we'll look at his, for our last point, his victorious crowning. Let's read verses 9 and 10 again. But we see Jesus, who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through their sufferings. Jesus came down with a very clear purpose to suffer death on behalf of every man and in doing so, receiving a crown of glory and honor so that he can become the captain, or I, I like to think the founder of our salvation for all mankind, right? It required Christ coming down to have that crowning achievement of dying on the cross, which effectively gave us the opportunity to be saved, to be made right with God. So consider the magnitude and the significance of God being clothed in man's flesh, suffering the cruelest death at the hands of those men which he actually came down to save. What a savior we serve. To come down and to experience death at the men, at the hands of those men who were crucifying him, who he came to save. The end of verse 9 says that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Think about it. The last few words, should taste death for every man. Not only does this phrase alone disprove the fallacy of Calvinism, right, to think that God uh, can or only does save uh, some people and not others or, or can't potentially save everyone. We see Jesus died for every man, not just the chosen of God. But we also see how it was truly of grace that God sent his only begotten son to die. Look, again, end of verse 9 that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. It was of God's grace that sent his only begotten son to die. And I don't know if you're all familiar, the acrostic definition of grace. Someone want to raise your hand? You know what it is? Grace? Someone? Someone? Amen. God's riches at Christ's expense. And so how appropriate this definition is, in light of this passage of Scripture, right? That he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Right? Think about it. God's riches, salvation, by God's grace, but, but what, was, what was the price? It was at Christ's expense of, of dying, tasting death for every man. Right? That is the definition of grace here at, in verse 9. And Jesus truly paid it all for us so that we could receive all of God's riches, I wrote down five things, but this is certainly not a comprehensive list. This is not exhaustive by any means.
But to think that because of Christ's sacrifice, because of God's grace in giving Christ to die for us, as saved people, we can experience an eternity in heaven. Right? Whereas our fate before was an eternity of damnation in the lake of fire, we now can have an eternity in heaven. We also can have a right relationship with God. So before that, in our lost state, we're at enmity with God. We're against God. There's no reconciliation to be had aside from salvation in Christ. And now we can have a right relationship with God to live a life that is actually pleasing to the Lord. Number three is that all of our sins have been cleansed away forever. Right? Think about that. Think about the guilt that our sin, how much guilt that weighed on our shoulders all of our lives before we were saved knowing that we were sinners, knowing that we were not right with God, knowing that we had to pay for these sins somehow one day in one way, shape, or form. And now, through salvation, all of those sins are washed away forevermore. We also, number four, have a new way and a new walk, right? Not only do we have all these other benefits, but now here, for the remainder of our lives, we have a new way, a new walk in Christ. We can please God. We can bring delight to God, as I preached on two weeks ago. Um, and uh, to be honest, that's something that's really stuck with me since that, since that message, being able to know that by the way I live my life, how I can please God, being cognizant of that and making sure that I'm doing it. And then number five, we have God's Holy Spirit indwelling us and leading us. Right? Just, just five benefits, but think of how priceless these things are if you're saved tonight. Right? How you could not live without them and having experienced them now as a Christian. Right? Imagine living or giving up any of these benefits, let alone all five, right? You, you wouldn't even consider it. And so it is because of the victorious crowning and sacrifice of Jesus that we are entitled to these benefits as saved people. Jesus is the captain of our salvation. He is the victor over sin and death, and he deserves all glory and honor. And I, I, a beautiful hymn that came to mind when I was preparing the message that many of us know called uh, One Day. And I think verse 1 and the chorus really sum all of this up that we're talking about now quite well. So I, I, I'm going to recite verse 1 and the chorus. Uh, verse 1. One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men, my example is he. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day. He came to bring many sons unto glory. Think about the glorious life we can live as Christians now because he came and sacrificed for us. Let's look again at verses 14 and 15 as we come to the end of our message here tonight. Verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood... He also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. As saved people, we were in bondage our whole lives unto sin and were on the road to physical and spiritual death. But thanks to Jesus' life and death and him being 100% man, right, in the same form, as us, and 100% God, we now have been delivered from death and from sin. You know, I think about it, at, if I go back to verse 15, he came to deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. And that bondage could mean a bunch of different things, right? The fear of dying and going to hell, the fear of, of being stuck forever in your sin, the fear of not being able to have a right relationship with God, he came to deliver all of that, to, to get rid of all of that, that all, all men at one point or another will face that fear, that bondage to sin, a lifetime subjected to that. But it doesn't have to be that way, right? Because he came to deliver us from that. If Jesus did not rise again, we'd still yet be in our sins. But because he was victorious over the grave, we now have been made clean and can also live victoriously in Christ, right? Our example he overcame not only death, but sin. We can overcome sin as well as Christians. And so we saw the need to be a vigilant Christian. We saw our visiting creator as well as the victorious crowning of our Savior. And my heart's desire was to lift up Christ in this place tonight. 
That's really, before I even knew the text that I was going to preach from, I knew God wanted me to, to preach on his son and to lift him up in, in some way, shape, or form. And I'm thankful that he brought me to Hebrews chapter 2. And so I want us to see Christ, our great example, our captain, our deliverer, our savior. Christian, I encourage you to express your gratitude to the Lord tonight for your salvation and for who God is and all that he went through, all he had to experience to give you the gift, truly, of salvation. And lost person, your fate does not need to be unto death and eternal damnation because Christ's payment is sufficient for all men and he has overcome the power of death so that all may be saved. So come, lost person, tonight and receive that precious gift offered freely to you again here this evening. Let's all stand and pray. Father, thank you so much for this text and the richness of it all, Lord, to see all the things that we were able to go through tonight and, and preach from. Father, for the saved, I pray that all of us would take heed, take earnest heed to the things which we've heard, to the things which we know. Don't allow other outside influences to impact our walk with you and to be thankful for who you are, the captain of our salvation, and for coming and dwelling among us, for visiting us, Lord, like you do. Father, I pray for the lost tonight. They would consider their soul before it's too late. See that you love them so much and you want them to be saved. You've made it all possible. All they have to do is receive a gift. Pray that you bless our time of prayer now. In Jesus' name.